I want to do something a little different with Thinking Medieval today. I want to tell you about video games that I've really enjoyed that have taught me a little bit about history. Maybe the way to learn more about the past isn't to just look at it online or to be told about it by some dude making a weekly video essay, but rather to actually experience it. So let me tell you a little bit about my experiences of history through video games. I'm Anirudh Kanisetti, historian author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below, and remember that we're all figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. I saw the world through the eyes of a man living in 15th century Bohemia or present-day Czechia. I entered a great cathedral gasping at its immaculately painted walls and its looming ceiling decorated with stars. That's not why the scene is stuck in my mind, it's because my video game character was blind drunk. Right after entering the cathedral, I had to deliver a sermon on the fiery reformer Jan Hus to an impatient crowd. I can still tell you what Hus believed and about the peasant rebellion he sparked off. A combination of irreverence and curiosity is how we make history memorable, by experiencing the past. The game I was just telling you about is called Kingdom Come Deliverance, played from the perspective of Henry, a blacksmith's son turned Lord's retainer. Quite early in the game, Henry's village is attacked by an army. He watches in horror as hundreds of heavily armed men appear on the horizon and is powerless to fight them as they ransack and burn his village and kill his friends and family. This isn't a perspective we see much in India. All too often, wars are depicted in our media as a glorious clash between heroes and villains. But in reality, war is brutal and bloody, the result of endless political and diplomatic failures, and is the consequence of valorizing the most violent. And those who fare worst in war are usually the voiceless, the undefended. Ended. It took a while for me to come around to this way of seeing the past. Most of the early video games I played were about violence from the top down, letting you play as kings sending armies at your enemies. Some of my most memorable experiences were with the Total War series set in various historical time periods such as ancient Rome, medieval Europe, and pre-shogunate Japan. You manage a rudimentary economic simulation of your empire, but that's just to pay for the enormous armies that you command on the battlefield. You prepare infantry units to take the brunt of an enemy advance, you find a hill to position your archers on, or you conceal your cavalry from a decisive blow. There's something satisfying about dismantling larger armies through superior tactics, but also shows you how history's terrible conquerors came to rule sprawling empires, not by commanding enormous hordes, but through smart tactics and maneuvering. Much more satisfying and disturbing to play was Europa Universalis IV, a deep grand strategy game set in the era of global colonization. Starting in 1444, it allows you to play as any state in the world, from England to Vijayanagara, up till 1821. It's primarily an economics simulator, encouraging players to manipulate the flows of trade goods and to ratchet up administrative capacity to extract taxes and manpower for their armies. It allows you to engage in the most ridiculous alternate history scenarios. I once played as a martial Vijayanagara, conquered most of the Indian subcontinent, and colonized Australia and East Africa. In another campaign, as a multi-ethnic Mughal Empire, I conquered half of China and then used Hawaii as a forward base for an Asian conquest of the Spanish Americas, led by the Mughal Sons of Heaven and their Vijayanagari queens. I also thoroughly enjoyed Crusader Kings 2 by the same developer, Paradox Interactive, which allows you to play as a royal court from 800 to 1400. Crusader Kings 2 is more focused on the people of the court than the state. Their maneuvering so far, their lobbying, seductions, rivalries, and quirks. And like any medieval patriarch, you arrange marriages for your children and grandchildren so as to snowball your family's influence and properties. You also indulge in a spot of murder and war to ensure your schemes work out as planned. And playing the subcontinent, I was quite thrilled to take the role of a Chola Emperor and maneuver my relations onto thrones from Andhra Pradesh to Assam. The former actually retreaded real Chola history quite well. Crusader Kings 2 also leans into the absurd at times. It allows you to make your horse a minister if you're crazy enough, which some players have manipulated to create dynasties of horse rulers and even horse popes. But European Universalis 4 and Crusader Kings 2 never really encourage you to think about the 
moral consequences of your actions. They're all about amoral geopolitics, where history is a linear process resulting from technological advancement or the accumulation of masses of property. You can choose to murder a rival's children or genocide the indigenous peoples of your colonies. And it's presented through little more than a text box and a button you can click. You can make armies that eat the food output of entire provinces and fight wars that kill hundreds of thousands of people. But none of this ever works out to anything more than a few positive or negative modifiers to your bottom line. And your state is never seriously challenged by its ability to rule sprawling territories, which is something that every historical ruler really struggled with. This is a pretty myopic reading of history, if you ask me, because it reduces it to only the cost-benefit analyses of courts and trade companies. The historical gaming genre has experienced a renaissance in recent years. A generational shift is underway as more young people find studios, absorb influences, and experiment. I really enjoy historical city builders like Anno 1800 and Kingdoms and Castles, which allow players to set up agriculture and manage craft production chains. Wheat growers need to be linked to, say, meat farmers or beer brewers. Meat farmers can be linked to canning factories. Beer and cured meat can then be exported for profit. It's not as stressful as it sounds, I promise. It also gave me a deeper appreciation of urbanization itself. Cities are marvels of organization and cooperation, and actually experiencing the challenges of urban growth give you a perspective on both medieval and modern urbanism. While I tend to play India or India-inspired campaigns in games that allow it, I'll be the first to admit that India is generally pretty absent from historical games. Even in European Osalus IV and Crusader Kings II, the focus is on Europe. And that's fair, the West's gaming ecosystem tends to focus on periods and regions that inspire them, and in history is not easy to get into. Academic texts can be dense, and politicized misconceptions of history rule the Indian internet. And despite our ever-growing gaming market, we're still in the early stage of our video game journey. We need more experienced front-end game leads and designers. Recently, an India-based studio was set to remake a beloved title, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, some of, uh, some of you may have played it, but the project was disastrously mismanaged. And as a setting, aside from the odd Bombay level in Hitman 2 or exoticized treasure hunting locations in Uncharted The Lost Legacy, India's video game footprint is pretty minimal. It doesn't help that Indians online can be pretty easy to offend, as the comments on my videos usually show me, and as the furor of the inclusion of Hindu gods in the fighting game Smite shows. We can't have creative explorations of the past if history's only approach with folded hands. I shudder to imagine the backlash to an Indian kingdom come deliverance that pokes fun at kings, priests, and warriors. With all this said, there are tremendously exciting games coming out from Indian history lovers abroad, collaborating with Indian historians. I briefly consulted with Semi-Myth Entertainment, who are working on Alliance Age, a strategy game set in 16th century India, based around Sher Shah Suri and Humayun that also allows players to get into personal and political entanglements with the vibrant military and courtly labor market of the time. Saverio Spagnole, a mathematics professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, has also developed Vijayanagara, the medieval empires of Deccan India, a board game in consultation with historian Aparna Kapadia. This will enable players to actually take the roles of Vijayanagara, the Bahmani, and Deccan Sultanates and actually game out the complex dynamics of the time instead of just watching yet another video about intolerance and religious violence in the medieval world. There's a long way to go for India in games, but I think the future is bright. Pune-based Nodding Heads games received some attention for their action-adventure game Raji, an ancient epic. We'd love to hear what you think if you've played it. Gamers across the world are happy to explore new cultures and periods only if the game is fun. The Assassin's Creed series has explored everything from Victorian England to Abbasid Baghdad, selling millions of copies. And Eastern European countries have encouraged their gaming firms to become global giants. Think of CD Projekt Red, which burst onto the scene with The Witcher, inspired by dark Slavic mythology. If people can play Slavic mythology, they can play medieval Indian history as well. Until then, I'll wait for the game that'll allow me to explore Vijayanagara and its hubbub of markets and palaces on digital feet, bringing to life the astonishing creativity of that Renaissance city. And I'll dream of city builder games about medieval Tamil temple urbanism, requiring you to manage ghee supply chains, the import of camphor, and the manufacturing of jewelry. Someday, someday. 
If you have questions, comments, or video game recommendations, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anirbuddha and at Connected Histories and on Twitter at A. We'll see you next week.